So we are here at APEC with Omar Davidi, who is the co-founder and CEO of Be Hero. Very cool company. I want you to start by telling us what you do. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, we deal with uh, supporting the bees. Uh, so if I want to elaborate a little bit more, we are supporting beekeepers to manage beehives in a more efficient way and address the colony collapse disorder, the bee mortality issue that the world is facing. And the important part of it is not necessarily how it affects the honey industry, but the fact that 75% of the crops out there depends on those bees for pollination. So practically we are optimizing pollination process working very closely with beekeepers with low cost IoT sensors that we develop that goes into the beehives. So I want to unpack this a little bit because you've got AI, you've got tracking technology. Let's start with what was the genesis of this idea for you? When did you decide that bees was going to be your life work? Uh, so it's it's interesting. My background is cybersecurity. So you know the, the friends laugh at the fact that I moved from cybersecurity to food security. Uh, it started when I met one of my co-founders, uh, Itai Kanot, who is a second-generation commercial beekeeper, and I was keen to learn more about colony collapse disorder and the fact that there's not a lot of technology involved in in beekeeping. Trying to understand why, and that's where we started to think of you know let's pull data from inside hives and see whether technology can help. Uh, so the first part was to understand, you know, can you build a POC? The second one was to try and understand, can you build a successful company that addresses this kind of an issue? So what, you put technology inside the hive, what did you discover? What data did you glean from that exercise that then made you think there's a business here? So we, we have nine different sensors inside the hive on this unit that we develop. The major ones would be temperature, humidity, and sound. Some of the interesting uh, discoveries, I would say, is that the, the hive operates as a superorganism. It has one queen, which is, in a way, the heart of the colony. And the ability to identify certain patterns, so for example, if we look at the sound, we identified certain patterns that indicate that the bees are stressed because the queen is not performing well. Mm. Identifying a queen failure early on allows beekeepers to replace those queens and save those colonies. And that's what just one example of a situation of which you save a colony. Can I ask, what, did you glean anything about why colonies are collapsing? Like when you look across the, all the data that you've seen, you know, whether it's why the queen is under stress, is it climate related? That's what a lot of people think it is, or are there other factors you're seeing that come into play for failure? There are definitely other factors as well. So I think the fact that the environment changes and we have, you know, drier winters or extreme weather conditions in general affects the beekeeper's ability to address bee needs early on because they're not used to this environment behavior in a way. We see a lot more uh, issues with regards to queen failure, whether it's exposure to chemicals or whether it's just the intensity of beekeeping. Uh, a beekeeping industry was based on, on honey production for thousands of years. Yep. Over the last 10, 15 years, it became more oriented towards pollination because we build such a uh, efficient food system, but we need pollinators to support it. Yeah. So beekeepers are moving hives several times a year on trucks, millions Which of hives. Which is disruptive. Yeah. So they need to be able to address issues better. They need to be able to address disease early on. And be, because they don't have full transparency to what happens in every single hive 24 seven, they struggle to do so. So the evolution of your technology, um, I know you have the tracking technology and the sensors. How have the advances in AI impacted what you do? So I think in, in general, we see two aspects in, in technology that changes with time. Uh, the first one is the affordability of IoT components. So, you mm -hmm. know, it used to cost internet hundreds of, yeah, internet internet of things. things yeah. Right. So all the, the, the connectivity. Creating sort of like the connectivity and the hardware components is used to be extremely expensive. Right. Now with you know, a few dollars, uh, you can put a sensor in a hive and start collect data. So that's one thing that supports unit economics and, and the cup explained trying to introduce new solutions. The second thing is the access to AI components that we didn't have before, whether it's a, the affordability of those things or the computa computational power. And we spent the first few years of Be Hero to build a data set. It mm -hmm. was all about collecting data that was never existed before. And the second aspect is introducing 
AI models, as you uh, mentioned, in order to identify those patterns. And I think as we get, you know, we talk a lot about generative AI and so on, as we get more access to strong tools with the proprietary data that we've collect, we can introduce, you know, very interesting solutions across the board. Well, what are some of those solutions? Because because I'm imagining that you, you detect stress, let's say, I mean, not to be simplistic, but you detect something's going wrong. The queen's failing somehow. Do, do the beekeepers then bring a new queen, introduce a new queen before failure takes place? Or how does, what is the human interaction that actually staves off disaster here? I think it's a discussion that we tend to have, like, you know, whether AI will replace humans or whether it needs to walk and support humans. And I think what we see now is that the beekeepers, the commercial beekeepers that survive until now are good beekeepers. They know how to keep their bees. It's about giving them access to data and transparency they didn't have before. Right. So when we alert them about queen failure, they know how to replace queens. When we alert about certain diseases, they know how to treat them. The majority of issues that we encounter with can be treated, and if treated early on, the, the probability of success is almost 100%. And that's why you need to combine, I would say, the expertise of a commercial beekeeper together with new tools that are now affordable, affordable and available. So beekeepers don't strike me as, as necessarily the wealthiest people on the planet, they can be. When you look at your business model, um, it's almost feels a little bit like a, a B to C model, I'm sure it's not. Is there an enterprise model around this? Like, are the big food companies, which are also worried about food security, are they looking to you as well to help them? So the first thing we, we understood is that we need to work with, as partners with the commercial beekeepers. So our customers are not the commercial beekeepers. Those are our partners in order to introduce better pollination practices yeah. to the industry. Uh, we sell precision pollination as a service directly to the farmers, and that's where we introduced this more of a B2B model. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the interesting developments, we got the General Mills who joined our Series B a year ago, and we start to open the doors into those big retailers that are focused on biodiversity and sustainable agriculture and different ways that consumers cares about and now we have metrics, we can measure objectives uh, in order to introduce more sustainable score or metrics uh, to assess the, the, the things that we buy and we eat. So I think we're probably still two years away from what happened in the you know, carbon emission space, yeah. uh, but it's getting there, I'm sure it's getting there. Okay, when you say two years away from what happened in the carbon emission space, what happened in the carbon emission, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about carbon credits and sort of a common platform or just clarify? So we, we see a lot of initiatives that talks about, you know, pollinator friendly, bee friendly, biodiversity, like things that we need to address as we grow food, unless we want to, you know, mortgage all the resources of our next yeah, and, yeah. And, and next generations. Um, with the carbon emission, there's a, an easy way to assess the, the emission. Right, and then you can build a marketplace of which, you know, big companies can buy the uh, credits from, from others to be a little bit more ESG driven and so on. I think on the biodiversity aspect, B aspects and so on, it's still unclear how do we want to measure those things. Once we identify the objectives that we measure, then we can establish some sort of a marketplace. Now that's not so is being that your role. goal? You'd like to establish a marketplace or be a player in a marketplace? We want to support the marketplace. We, we're not the right entity to develop this marketplace. I think it's, it should be a coalition of big retailers that decide, okay, this is how we're going to measure things and consumer needs to agree with it. Uh, for us, it's about providing access to data that was never available before. So yeah. you can really understand what was the mortality rates of bee colonies during pollination activity. You can really track when use of chemicals was used in order to treat certain disease without affecting biodiversity. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a, a balance that we need to find because the population is growing. We need to become more efficient, but we need to, to do it in a more sustainable way. I feel like I'm quizzing you on a quiz show here because you may or may not know the answer, but how many bees are there in the world and how, how much have the numbers gone down? Just for some clarity, because we always hear about it in percentage terms. Mm -hmm. So today we have around 100 million beehives worldwide. Uh, and we tend to see around 40% mortality every year. So, you know, think wow. of 
40 percent of, of cattle will die every year that's that's, a, that's, that's a, a, a calamity night, right? on a um, beekeepers are spending a lot more resources in order to revive those dead hives, so the bee population is pretty stable over the last few years. I think that the, the bigger concern is the fact that commercial beekeepers are getting older. The average age of a commercial beekeeper in the U.S. today is around 70. 70. So, you know, 10 Has years from now. Has not been a lucrative profession perhaps for the next generation. Because the, the margin drops, it becomes, you know, intense, uh, labor intense work and, and you don't get the good ROI so why would the next generation continue and that's where we need to you know find a better way as, as an ecosystem to support beekeepers who are basically holding the, the, the food supply system uh, and, and making sure that they benefit from doing this and also we support the farmers otherwise we might wake up one day and and we'll have no beekeepers to, to no, manage and, and those they are hives. so critical to the you know ecosystem um, is your technology applicable to other areas? Like even you're talking about biodiversity, obviously there are many human guardians of animal colonies that we watch. I mean, how do you think about where the growth comes from other than market you know, expansion? And yeah, so we, we, we definitely started with you know, the US market and we focused uh, at the beginning in the almond industry in, in California, which produce 80% of the almonds in the world. So it's, you know, it's quite cons concentrated area of which almond being grown and now we spread to cherries and apples and blueberries and many other crops. All within the context of bees. Yes, uh, we, we've we done some interesting research collaborations with seed producers. So vegetable seed requires pollination as well and they struggle a lot with the challenge of pollination. So we introduced also infield sensors and that takes us maybe one step further towards the biodiversity place. So today we provide seed producers indications about the pollination activity in the field, not just by the honeybees, the Apis milfera that we refer to, but also about bumblebees and hoverflies and some other pollinators. So it gives a better understanding of how growing those seeds or, or food in, in general affects also the environment. Can you give us some sense of your success? Maybe you can't tell me what your revenue is, but, but how many customers do you have or how much of the market do you have? So I think w w one of the things that I've heard, you know, coming into the agtech industry that you cannot scale companies very fast in this industry. And I think the smart thing we've done in the early days, maybe it was luck, you know, you, you, you can backtrack and, and try to figure out. We try to focus not necessarily on the best way to monetize our technology, but on the measurable objectives. And we've managed to become the largest pollination provider in the U.S. in four years. Okay. So we scaled to tens of millions of dollars in revenues. It's going to be triple digits, ideally, in 2024 if we meet our, our goals. Uh, so we, we are scaling very fast uh, in this industry. We're introduced to more geographies. We became the largest pollination provider in Australia this year. Mm -hmm. um, so the adoption is good. Uh, I think the fact that we created this win-win-win model where the beekeepers benefit using new technology the farmers get small assurance into the pollination process and we can leverage the technology in the best possible way allows us to create an ecosystem where everyone wants be hero to basically scale yeah um, anything that else is on your radar in terms of what's next and around the corner for you in terms of what's exciting as an entrepreneur one of the interesting things that we've built over the last over six years is the largest data set of bees and pollination out there uh, and we got now to a scale of which we track and monitor pollination activity of a significant portion of, of different crops. So, you know, we've pollinated 10% of the almonds in the U.S., which is around 8% of the almonds in the world. Mm -hmm. Early on the indications about pollination activity supports commodity traders in making smart decisions on, you know, pricing and supply. So we are now working with some big commodity traders and hedge funds to see how we can leverage pollination data, bee data, to in help order them to sell futures, basically? In a way, yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. So Great. always new opportunities comes up. You'll be an investment up. play. <laughs> so that's good. Well, thank you for joining us. And I hope wish you a successful event here and um, look forward to what's next for your company. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.